Let's jump to the slides. And let's talk about interest groups in more depth. Sometimes or many times called special interests. They're also known as pressure groups. A lobbying group. Organized interests, a faction, several different uh, titles for them, but they are simply uh, a group of people that have similarities in an issue or they, they, they have common goals that they would like to see in, um, addressed and, and policies implemented. And they are organized so that they can influence policymakers, senators, politicians. They do uh, expend a lot of money and effort trying to get officials to either support their bills or sponsor their bills. Uh, and keep their interests in mind. So this is something that's unique in American government because um, we have more interest groups than any nation. And so you can influence the government on an individual level and you can be involved in groups. And as we mentioned on Monday, there was several entry points for groups to try to influence uh, their government leaders. So here's what uh, breaks down uh, a little bit more what they want or, or what, what they get. Now remember, uh, both of these groups, both of these um, types of groups, interest groups and political parties, uh, which we talked about at the end of chapter eight, both of these are linkage organizations. They link people to the government. But here's um, some differences that they have and they come in the area of making nominations, what their primary focus is, and what is the, uh, the range or the scope of their issue or interest. Political parties are those who oversee the process of nominating individuals for positions, while interest groups want to influence whoever is nominated. Political parties want to control the government. That was talked about a little bit last night with the the new Supreme Court nominee, Amy Barrett Comey. Is that right? Is it Comey? Amy Coney Barrett, not Amy Barrett Coney. Sorry. But um, what was brought up concerning that is that 
if she gets if she gets uh if she does get uh installed before the election then we would have something that would be pretty rare in American government. You would have uh, the Republicans in control of the executive office, the Republicans in control of the legislative branch, and then the judicial branch would be more conservative, which is in the realm of Republicans. Before Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, um, it was still five to four in favor of conservatives. But Chief Justice Roberts, he had become the swing vote after the death of William Rehnquist a few years ago. What we, what we mean by that is even though Chief Roberts was nominated by George Bush and he leaned conservative, a lot of his votes, a lot of times, he sides with the liberal judges. So with Ruth Bader Ginsburg dying, you now have three primary left-leaning left judges. And if Amy Barrett gets put in, that would be six conservative judges. And even if John Roberts was to side with the left-leaning ones, it would still be a five to four majority for conservatives. Now there's always the chance that some other conservative will um, side with the left. But this just kind of tilts the balance a little bit more towards the conservative side. So you would have a political party, the Republicans, in essence, controlling government. Now that could all end if Biden wins in November, and then the executive branch would go back to Democrat. But um, political parties, their primary focus is to win elections and control the government while interest groups simply are trying to influence policies that the government creates. Political parties have to deal with the whole spectrum of political issues, while interest groups usually tend to focus uh, that you have single issue interest groups like the NRA, here's their website. Their single focus issue is to protect the Second Amendment. So I'm bringing up the menu here and looking at trying to find their section that says about the NRA, maybe it's up here. Anyway, you can see that their interests, their primary, their primary interest is protecting the Second Amendment, but you can see that it kind of branches out into several uses of firearms, not just hunting, um, and not just being, not, not just having a citizenry, citizenry that can be armed in case of a armed conflict. Now remember when the uh, Second Amendment was written, we had gone through the Revolutionary War and a couple of the first battles in 1775 pitted the mighty English army against some of our militias or Minutemen, farmers and uh, small business owners who uh, had their guns. 
but they now have competitive shooting, firearms training, hunting. Here, this might tell us about the NRA. History of the NRA. So this was formed after the Civil War, 1871. You had a couple of Union veterans, that would be the North. They were, uh, they were kind of discouraged by uh, the troops around this time who weren't very good at shooting. So the primary goal at the time was to promote and encourage rifle shooting on a scientific basis. So that's interesting. But that's a single issue interest group. You do have some interest groups that um, have multi issues, but none of them are like a political party that covers the whole range of issues. Interest groups, of course, are lobbying groups, so they do lobby. And the various ways that they lobby is, of course, to have some groups have full time lobbyists in Washington, D.C., who try to get as much access as possible to our leaders. If you join an interest group, you can write letters to your congressman, to the president, make phone calls. You can help raise money. Of course, you can give money. You could even form uh, a small local NRA chapter or whatever interest group it is. Some of you might want to go down to your local How or Arcoma or Vianne Citizens for Biden and see what they're doing. I thought that might get a chuckle. Because as most of you wrote in your uh, your report from module one about the different political ideologies, most Southeast Oklahoma is pretty much conservative. There's probably not going to be any local Biden groups in our small towns. I thought you all might chuckle at that. Anyway, interest groups also debate publicly. although you don't see that a lot. And they can also use money that they raise to put television ads on to inform the public. I think a uh, you guys have probably seen this group that has put an ad on the uh, te television for Jim Inhofe. It's the it's, it's a law enforcement group throwing their support behind Jim Inhofe in his uh, Senate race against Abby Myers. There are different types of interest groups. The largest type of interest group is an economic in our in our economic interest groups. These are groups that are going to uh, want to be seeing policies passed that help corporations make more money. They also would also uh, deal with other financial issues like um, minimum wage, payroll taxes, Uh, job 
job creation, whatever it is to uh, advance economic prosperity. And then you have a subset of economic interest groups. Uh, there are business. Oh, uh, our textbook mentions that economic interest groups outnumber all other interest groups combined by two to one. And then the different types of economic groups include business groups, farm or agricultural groups, labor groups. professional groups. I've got one here to show you. Some of you said you wanted to become a teacher. And so the National Education Association, if we go to the about link right here, <clears throat> the uh, NEA or National Education Association has affiliate organizations in every state and in more than 14,000 communities. They have a membership of over 3 million teachers and they have other allies and their purpose is to advance justice and excellence in public education. Then here are their um, here are more of the logistics of what they do, who they are, their mission, values, and vision. Again, championing justice and excellence in public education. Out of the 3 million members, they elect 9,000 delegates. And then those delegates elect top officers. Those would be the ones that would be your main lobbyists in DC. They debate issues. You would, you would see these people like on a segment of CNN or Fox News, you know, here to talk about the issue of uh, education is so and so from the National Education Association. They they uh, talk about their diversity because they have members all over the continental United States as well as Hawaii and Alaska. So all kinds of information there about the National Education Association. I believe it's the largest Forgive me for using Wikipedia. Believe ah, believe it's the large yeah the is the largest labor union and professional interest group in the United States. So those of you that are going into certain areas of uh, vocation, most likely you can find a, a professional labor group or interest group in that profession. My wife is a physical therapist. She has been a member of the American Physical Therapy Association since she graduated from OU Physical Therapy School. You have farm groups that, again, take care of farm issues, 
The largest farm group is the um, American Farm Bureau Federation, saying they are the voice of agriculture. We go to their about page and independent non-governmental voluntary organization governed by and representing farm and ranch families. The purpose is to analyze their problems and formulate action to achieve educational improvement, economic opportunity and social advancement and thereby to promote the national well-being. Translation, farmers and ranchers are absolutely essential to the well-being of the United States of America. And their scope is on the local, county, state, national, and international levels. They are the voice of agricultural producers at all levels. So advocacy would be leaders that they put in high positions to, again, lobby and uh, seek policy. That would be helpful for ranchers like this family. You can go on here and get their 2019 impact report. They want to educate. Now, there are, there are several other farm interest groups, uh, but I believe this is the largest one, and they have a broad, broad range of issues. But you do have smaller farm groups, for example, that they focus on small family farms. They want to protect the small farmers uh from being completely overrun and ignored by the the, the large farm uh corporations think of think of some of the big chicken companies that have uh chicken houses in your your areas uh some of you may have some swine farms that uh, fall under big groups like Cargill. <clears throat> a lot of times those big uh, corporate agricultural farms, livestock farms, they do a lot of harm to local farmers. So you have groups that are, you have smaller farm interest groups that are there to protect smaller farm families labor groups you know they they want to protect union groups and labor uh, like you might have mine workers associations uh, car manufacturer associations here's some more examples this little cartoon's got the politician and it says nobody tells me what to do or say and on the pencil, if you can't see it, it says lobbyists. There are perks for politicians who support some of these groups, financial perks, other types of benefits that they get. It, in a sense, is a form of bribery. It, and there, ha there has been regulations put on lobbying and a big issue you hear a lot of times we haven't heard much about it this year is campaign finance reform um, having regulations for how much money a presidential candidate or a senatorial candidate how much money they can receive from not just individuals but from interest groups and lobbies
Other types of groups besides economic interests are environmental interest groups. And uh, these groups would fall under what our textbook calls citizen groups. The environment, like the Audubon group, which is an environmental group, equality interests. These are citizen groups that aren't focused on economics and finances, but usually they are trying to advance a purpose for a good cause. Consumer and public interest lobbies. Thinking of the BBB when it comes to consumer lobbies, the Better Business Bureau. If you see one of those made for, if you see one of those products on TV, uh, like um, uh, what's one that's going around lately? Can't, you can't order this on amazon.com. Uh, oh, the uh, couple months ago, it was going strong was the uh, Liberty Lift. This thing that you could use if somebody in your family fell down and they couldn't get up. Let's say your, your big bone dad fell down and, and you're only 110 pounds. Liberty Lift will help you lift him up. Well, how do you know if that's a good product? Go to the Better Business Bureau website, type in that product, and you can read all the reviews about it. So consumer interest groups, public interest groups. A couple of interest groups that I had here, their websites highlighted. Um, textbook mentions that this is the largest economic union in the United States, the AFL-CIO. Don't ask me to tell you what that means. I have to look it up again if I can find the menu. Maybe it's down here. The American Federal, I'm sorry, the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. And what it is, it is a federation of 56 different national and international labor unions. Now that's interesting right there. International labor unions that are a part of the American Federation. 12.5 million people are represented by this big umbrella. This big umbrella interest group. So then you've got here the uh, National Association of Manufacturers. This is another um, labor group that works for 12.8 million men and women who make things in America. And then we had the Farm Bureau. Right. On page 258, 259, there are some advantages and disadvantages to um, these groups. Someone, if you would mute your mute your computer because I'm getting your class. I think it's George. You might read about those advantages and disadvantages disadvantages between economic interest groups and citizen e interest groups. But we're gonna stop there and we'll pick up with um, uh, lobbying 
and finish the chapter on Friday. So any questions on interest groups? All right. Have a good day and look forward to seeing you on Friday.